ever get brought into it without having a vote? Well, how did we get put into the Trans-Pacific Partnership without a say? This is the nature of global governance. What is the EU? What is global governance? Why is it promoting global carbon taxes? Well, to fund itself. Lord Christopher Monckton was one of the top advisors and in the cabinet of Margaret Thatcher. He's a best-selling author and researcher, a top inventor, and is uh, no stranger to this audience. He'll just be with us till the bottom of the hour. Maybe a little bit more if he has time. But I wanted to get his take specifically on what's happening in Greece. Because from my perspective, whether Greece gets bailed out or not, the EU is designed to create financial crisis to consolidate nation states. Just two years ago, the EU announced a move to get the nation states like France and Spain and others to not even call their national teams the French or the Spanish, but to give them now basically dinosaur and superhero names and mythical names because even the idea of having national teams is xenophobic and bad. See, political correctness is to kill any national independent ideology. And when you research deeper, most of Greeks' so-called debt is globalist bank-run derivatives that have been signed on to. And separately, we have the announcements they're going to bail in and take money out of people's bank accounts. China has started doing that. That happened, uh, of course, a few years ago uh, in, there in the Mediterranean uh, as well in Cyprus. And now banks are making similar announcements and preparations here. And they're acting like cash is illegal. So this is a very dangerous situation we're in. Some say it could bring down the whole world economy. I wanted to get the um, perspective of a man who's been, uh, again, at the highest levels of government, been an editor of a major newspaper, studied the financial situation in Greece, is one of the main opponents of the European dictatorship. Lord Moncton, thank you for joining us. Well, Alex, it's a pleasure to be with you. And in a way, I could say I told you so, because in 1996, I gave a lecture to the faculties of economics and of international relations at the University of St. Andrews here in Scotland. And what I said was, look, the euro is going to fail. Now, it didn't even start for three years after that, but already I knew it was going to fail because they didn't understand the elementary economics of trying to put together an area with a single currency. You have to have nations who are all more or less kind of economically competent at the same level. This is known as the economics of optimal currency areas. Now, these words are simply not known by the average politician. And as a result, they sailed ahead with the euro when it couldn't possibly work. Now it's failed. But here's the warning. If uh, this one has failed, imagine how much bigger the failure will be when the UN gets its way in Paris this December and sets up a world government which is like the EU, but on a global scale, with no escape for anyone, at least at the moment. If you don't like the EU, you can get out and go to the States or go to, go to somewhere, Canada, Australia. You don't have to be in the EU. But if there's a global government, there's no escape unless you've got a spaceship. And the problem is that these politically correct people you were talking of, the people who think there is only one view, and that's the Marxist view, and nothing else should be allowed to prevail... These people are dangerous. It was they who captured the European Union. They didn't actually set it up, but they captured it very quickly after it was set up. As you know, the KGB was largely instrumental in founding the euro dollar market and had a lot of influence on shaping the creation of the euro because they knew that the euro would undermine the economies of the EU, which it's now doing, even though Britain is outside the EU. We are threatened by the bankruptcy of Greece. Because this could bring down a house of cards with Portugal, Spain, Ireland, even France, Italy, Belgium, all these countries, Poland, they're all running massive debts. They're all in serious financial trouble. Lord Moncton, financial trouble is made worse by the euro. You call it the EU dictatorship. You just don't. 
use that word lightly. That's not rhetoric. Explain to them why you call it a dictatorship and what percentage uh, of uh, UK laws are now f by imperial edict uh, from the shadow bureaucracy. That's right. Now, five laws out of every six that are made in the United Kingdom and inflicted upon us are made because the unelected commissars of the European Union, who have the sole right to propose legislation for the whole of Europe, and that legislation takes precedence over all our own domestic legislation, they have to do what the commissars tell us to do. Commissar is the official German name for the 30 people who, behind closed doors, run Europe. They have absolute power, enormous wealth, and no responsibility. These are the people who now dictate to us mm -hmm. what our laws shall be. Democracy has gone from within the European Union. It will go from the world as a whole if the EU and the UN get together at Paris, as they are already planning to do, to set up a world government in the name of saving the planet from... I want to talk about that world government because they tried five, six years ago. You were there, got the secret document. Of course, you got no credit. It was just devastating victory. It was like winning a major war, stopping that global government treaty that they tried to keep secret. They're keeping TPP secret. But now more and more, uh, the Pope's calling for global governance on climate change. Uh, it seems the whole system uh, and their operatives are coming out, uh, being honest at least on the surface, that yes, it's global government, but they're selling it as something to save people. But you talk about how they use the Soviet or communist German name Commissar for their political officers. The Commissars, of course, were the political police in the Soviet Union under Obama. This is mainstream news. The Pentagon in 2010 said they're, quote, preparing to arrest libertarians and conservatives. This is actually in the Army document and put them in, quote, re-education camps. It actually says re-education camps, so fantastical, so over the well, top. We're going, this, is the, this is the danger, because not only have you got the entire governing class now ganging up on the people in individual nations. I mean, look at your Supreme Court. It got one out of its three big decisions right, and look how badly wrong the other two were. You have the Supreme Court, unelected by anyone, effectively making new law, contrary to the Constitution, Unprecedented. contrary to its obligations. And why are they all doing this? Why is the Pentagon joining in and saying, right, we're going to lock up the likes of Moncton and Jones in re-education camps? Why are they doing this? Well, that was my because point. They... I'm not joking. I feel like a liar huh? when I say that because it sounds so outrageous, but I can show people the mainstream article in the Army document. Why would they use terms like commissar and re-education? I, I mean, they're using actual totalitarian terminology. They're not even hiding it why because they think they've got away with it and they may have got away with it um, the problem is that at paris in december which is the really big climate conference this is the big push where the entire kind of communist group worldwide is getting together and has captured most governments now in fact very nearly all governments i think are going to sign this agreement now, the one thing that needs to be in that agreement to stop it setting up a world government is a clause the same as the clause that's in the Kyoto Protocol, which preceded this one. And the Kyoto Protocol of 1997, which America didn't sign under Al Gore as president of the Senate, um, because 95 out of 100 senators voted it down. But even that protocol at least contained what's called a freedom clause. It's a secession clause, technically, is the name for it. It means that any country after six months or a year who doesn't like the obligations under the Kyoto Protocol can simply give notice and break free. Canada's done it, Russia's done it, Japan's done it, several others, I think, will do it when they get the chance. But what is now being proposed is a treaty like the European treaties, which have no escape clauses. Once you're in... You are subject to the alien power, whether you like it or not, whether your voters like it or not, whether your Congress likes it or not. That's why this really is the end of democracy. It's the end of democracy, not just in some sort of general hand-waving, eye-rolling sense. It's the end of democracy because the law in future will make sure that the supreme law that applies to the United States after Paris will be the law made by what at the moment the treaty draft, because I have seen it, is calling a governing body. Now, six years ago at Copenhagen, which you mentioned earlier, they called it a government. 
They're now calling it a governing body, but it's going to have even bigger powers of government than the government they were going to establish in Copenhagen. And much of it is already in place. They've just quietly steamed ahead, regardless of the defeat at Copenhagen, and put a thousand new international bureaucracies in place, all interlocking with one another. The Pentagon talks to them, of course, the EU is in there. And there's now a thousand of these bureaucracies, which together will form the sinews, the enforcement arm, if you like, of this new hideous totalitarian global government. And all of this, of course, based on the climate lie, just as the European Union was based on the lie that the Soviet Union would otherwise pull Europe apart. In fact, NATO was already guaranteeing the security of Europe. We didn't need the European Union for that. And indeed, if anything, it has increased the risk of tension and war in Europe rather than reducing it. Absolutely. And, and you were right telling Thatcher that 30 years ago. It's certainly been proven true. Moving forward, as we're about to go to break, sir, and again, Lord Christopher Monckton joins us. So undoubtedly, do you agree with the point I've made and others are saying that this is the moment that they uncloak, admit world government, still deceive on the details, but basically emerge? I mean, it looks like this is the big assault. This is the next big phase, the big takeover. This is the big assault. This is the moment when they think they're going to get away with setting up a world government. And after the break, I'll tell you how we're going to stop them. It's an epic time to be alive, folks, because we're not just being conquered by some, you know, advanced civilization or something. We're being conquered by tyranny. Lord Monk will be with us for about 45 after, and then I'm going to... Big bad John. Get into Big John. the latest on Jade Helm, Nobody's where the mainstream media is misrepresenting what we're saying. We've never said it's an imminent military takeover. We've said what our own military sources have told us, that it is just further acclamation to have troops on the streets of America. Not to counter ISIS or Al-Qaeda, but to counter citizens during a state-level insurrection. And that means the state's taking their gold back from the Federal Reserve, things like that, that you now see happening. I told you the new governor in Texas knows what's going on. Look at this headline. We're training ISIS. White House website contradicts Obama's speech blooper. Now, I, I'm going to ask Lord Moncton about ISIS and it being out of control and why the West allowed it to get out of control and what he thinks about it in the next segment. But I, I just wanted to mention that now. Uh, that things are really starting to unravel with this narrative. When Obama says we shouldn't be bombing them, when the truth is they're really the free Syrian army that we helped arm. I mean, this is a big scandal about to break, in my view. But Lord Moncton was just joining us, probably the chief uh, EU critic in the world, helped uh, beef up and uh, promote UKIP, that's now one of the fastest growing parties in the world. Nigel Farage is saying... He believes uh, that we're seeing the beginning of the breakup of the EU. We'll get Lord Moncton's take on that. But global government from the TPP to the Atlantic Treaty, all of it's being welded together now. And the taxing authority for it, the carbon tax, is being pushed. That's why they'll never give it up, no matter how discredited it is. So, Lord Moncton, uh, you were saying before the break, we can stop it. You, going to the alternative press literally parachuting in in Durban, South Africa, when they wouldn't let you in, that stunt getting attention. You more than anybody, I know you don't want credit, but, but it's credit to humanity, credit to the individual taking action. Undoubtedly, if you didn't get the secret text of Copenhagen, undoubtedly, if you didn't pull stunts to expose it, undoubtedly, if the cops didn't beat you up and bring attention to what was happening, a lot of this stuff would have gotten through. So when you say we can stop the formation of open world government, I'm listening, what do we do? Right. The first thing is we're going to have to set up our own parallel freedom institutions worldwide. And the most important of these is a currency. If we take away their power to issue currency because we do it better than they do, then we'll stop them. When I gave that lecture in 1996 in St. Andrews University, I said the euro is just another me to fiat currency, no assets in the bank to prop it up. In fact, now it has negative assets in the bank propping it up. But if we were to set up our own currency, people would rush to use it. You can now make a currency of your own. It's no longer illegal. They can't stop you. As long as you don't print it or mint it, you just have it as an electronic instrument of saving 
against which you can switch your credit card, so you can, you can spend on it just as if you were spending in dollars, then we can stop inflation in its tracks. We can take currency away from central banks and put it back in the hands of the people and make a fortune doing it, Alex. That You and I could do this very well. I've been studying this for some years. I'm now just about ready to start. That is step one, which is that there's got to be our own independent currency. I totally agree. And, 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 and more transparent than Bitcoin. I'm not attacking Bitcoin. Oh, yeah. No, Bit Bitcoin I would attack because it is simply there's no assets at the back of that. That's why 78% of the value of Bitcoins was wiped out just last year alone. And the person who set it up committed suicide. It is a nightmare because they didn't do it right. What it shows is there's a huge demand for anything that isn't a government. And imagine one based on universal liberty and freedom promoting libertarian enlightenment ideas. Everyone would politically support it. Uh, and if it was backed by something real, explain this to me, it would be yes. a sensation. Certainly. You come to me with your Mickey Mouse dollars or euros or pounds. And I give you, let's call it the talent in return, and that would be simply an electronic unit of currency, just like a unit in a unit fund. And there would be fund managers who manage the fund that represents the talents I've given you. So you give me your dollars. I don't want to hold dollars because they're going to inflate away. So what I do is I spend those dollars quick, the day you give them to me, buying assets that go into the fund so that the entire currency is completely self-funding. And it's enormously profitable. That'd be the Those first currency to ever do that in history that wasn't fiat or based in gold. Give you an example. There was, there was the Mark Banco in Hamburg, which operated for 250 years until about 1800. And that was so stable because it was based on silver. It was always about 103%. Uh, this is so exciting. Uh, stay paper. there. Let's talk and about it more, Monk, when we get, come back. Long segment coming up. We'll also give you his website. When we return, I'm Alex Jones, InfoWars.com. I want to just take a moment here to thank God. Got the number 13. For the providence that, that three peoples head. throughout history have been given. And I want to thank God for the gift of consciousness and being alive on this planet. I don't want listeners to think I'm a negative person. There's so much good, so much creativity, so much beauty. So much honor in this world, but but good men and women tend to be very restrained and not take action, almost like embarrassed uh, to be aggressive or to give alternative ideas, and we just kind of quietly sit there and have our own lives, our own friends, and recluse from the system. If we do that, we're going to lose everything, because as I ended the last segment, this tyranny we face is not like the Romans. For all their barbarous problems, conquering an area and bringing aqueducts and science and overall improving life generally. You could argue that being conquered by the Romans, uh, if you were saying what's modern Switzerland today, turned out to be a good thing. In some cases, they weren't consciously trying to destroy everything, is the point. They were very abusive, very tyrannical. I'm not endorsing Roman civilization. You look at the elites we have today. They instinctively are just very twisted people. The ideology is anti-family, anti-stability. Why would our government fund ISIS to take over the Middle East and destabilize things and kill every Christian they find and blow up every church they find? I mean, our government's had some problems in the past, but I guarantee you Ronald Reagan wouldn't do that. I guarantee you John F. Kennedy wouldn't do that or Dwight D. Eisenhower. I mean, I don't romanticize these people, but we truly have new levels of corruption. The boss hogs that ran this country, LBJ, as corrupt as he was, would have never signed on to a TPP waiving Congress's power. They were territorial. This was their country they were running. So we have traitors, traitors in our midst, and, and I agree with Lord Moncton, they think they've got full control now of the major nation states, and it's why they're just moving at warp speed right now. And their operatives are activating everywhere. I know Lord Moncton's a Catholic. I have a lot of Catholic friends. I don't get into the whole Catholic or Protestant fight. I'm just a Christian. But this new pope activating and, and, and saying we need global government for you know the, uh, the carbon taxes. 
I mean, I don't know what they got on him or what's going on, but that's got to be decried. People are really showing which side they're on right now. This is the big move. And, I mean, there's the headline. Pope Francis calls for a new system of global government to tackle climate change. That's not an Infowars.com headline. That's in Time Magazine, Newsweek, the BBC. I, I mean, Lord Moncton, how do you square this? What has happened here is mm -hmm. that Pope Francis was brought up in the communist tradition of what's called liberation theology, which came out of the French universities, like so many other bad ideas, and it was taken back to, to Latin America by students for the priesthood who'd gone to study for university degrees in France. And, of course, one of those was Pope Francis. So he is an anti-capitalist through and through, he realizes the power of this environmental issue in two directions. One, as a way of rallying his fellow communists everywhere, and the other, as a way of getting himself to the high table. He's going to go to the UN and address the General Assembly, and they're going to cheer him to the echo because, of course, the UN, just like the EU, uses the climate as an excuse to gather more powers to itself. Now, the Pope wants to be part of that. And so what he's doing is repositioning the church as an entity which no longer opposes communism. Now, instead, it opposes capitalism. And this is really, I think, a mistake. If you were going to get into politics at all, you should certainly oppose communism and any other kind of totalitarianism. But the Pope is now... Uh, he's now come out in his true colours. He said, right, I am a communist. I am, want a world, communist world government. I want to be one of those in charge of it. And if anyone disagrees, then you know, that's bad. Well, we have to stand against this. And we have to say, with every respect to the Pope, respect to his office anyway, that this is not the way forward. Communism killed 100 million people. In conservatively, the conservatively. It's still, conservatively, it's still killing people today. The climate change thing is already killing people as well as they can't afford to heat or keep cool their homes, whichever climate they live in, because of absurdly high electricity prices. Global warming, even if it were to go to the sort of levels that the extremists predict of three or four Celsius degrees by the end of this century, which it won't, there hasn't been any this century at all, would not do very much harm. What will do harm is the global government that the Pope and the UN and most governments sure. in the world are determined to establish. What we've got here is the entire governing class worldwide yes. ganging up against the people. Now, here's the trick, Alex. What we've got to do is you can moan about it all you like, but that won't achieve anything. What we've got to do is to accept that we have ultimately the money that they depend on. We have the numbers as well. They don't. And so what we need to start doing is increasingly taking the government of our own nation and of the world into our hands, the hands of the free peoples of the world, and say to our governments, no, we do not want Islam to become the normal political setup. Let it be confined to being a religion. We want a democratic political setup by which the people decide what shape their government will take and not the governing class taking that, those decisions. And this is why I was talking earlier of the idea of establishing. And I want to get to that, but since you raise that point, the head of what you're mentioning, the head of EU security came out three days ago in a speech and also in an article and said we should have Islam as the political governing system, basically. So first they removed Christianity from society, even though it wasn't governing, it was an idea that helped guide things, uh, you know, kind of like streetlights at night. Now they're saying we should be absorbed by Islam. Why is there a suicidal bent by the leftist in Western civilization? They rule it, they've taken it over, it's the engine of prosperity, is there such an instinctive hatred of it that they have to uh, execute it as some act of uh, galactic vandalism, A? And then B, Lord Monk... You have to understand one thing about the left, which is absolutely crucial to understand, and that is that the left's ambition is to keep the poor poor because the poor, stupidly, vote left. 
The capitalist ambition, the freedom-loving libertarian's ambition, is to make everybody rich so that they won't vote left. That's the fundamental divide in politics. The totalitarians want to keep people poor so that they can push them around. But we will make people, people rich. It rich always so works if they just get out of our way. They don't want to do that. They, they want to run everything. Fingertip control. The very word totalitarian means they Total. want to control every tiny last little detail of our lives down to the last flickering, unreadable by poison-filled mercury light bulb. That's how they are. They cannot bear the idea of allowing people to take decisions for themselves. And the one thing that they are frightened of is people who are independent enough to do that. That's right. So if we, for instance, set up our own currency, if we set up our own parallel peoples, united democracies, forget the United Nations, let's have the united democracies, and let's start setting up a complete parallel set of global institutions that are governed not by the governing class, but by the votes of the people who wish to participate. And the left will find that very hard to take over because as long as we keep it democratic, they can't stop us. That's right. And Explain a little bit about how the UN and these other bodies are totalitarian because they always put provisos in like Article 30 of the UN Charter that says all these rights are null and void whenever we feel like it. But let's go back to a question I didn't quite get out to you. So for 30 years, they've said you're wrong. There's no move towards covert global socialist communist government. For 20 years, they've told me I'm wrong. For 30-something years, they've told Ron Paul he's wrong. For 50 years, they told Barry Goldwater he was wrong. Now this covert plan is in the headlines. I had Nightline here four years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. I had CBS Nightly News here two years ago. Uh, I, I, I don't even take the interviews anymore because they always distort them. And they look at me and I show them all these articles, all these clips of world leaders, Gordon Brown, you name it, calling for global government, Herman von Rumpy. Uh, Bill Clinton, and they looked at me and they said, that's a different global government than you're talking about, and then went on to say I was insane on television. So how do they square? There is no world government. There is, they, Al Gore was in Congress, as you know, eight years ago, and said there is no move for a carbon tax, and then proposed it a year later. What is this tactic of, of, of saying two plus two equals five, raising debt limit doesn't raise debt limit, if we've been exposing global governments coming, it's bad, it's totalitarian, they deny it, now it's here, how do they then not become discredited? How do they just make this shift, and why are they making the shift? Three words, Ion Mihai Pachepa. Now, he was the head of the Securitate, which was the secret police in Ceausescu's communist Romania about 30 years ago. Now, he was part of the largest directorate of the KGB, which was known as the Disinformatia Directorate, the Disinformation Directorate. That directorate had one million Western communists who were not known to be communists, not known to be working with the KGB, who were in the West, beavering away in the BBC, in the CBC, in the NBC, in the ABC, all the big TV networks, all the big newspapers, all the big industries, all the big trade unions, all the big churches. They were everywhere making sure that when the moment came, and the moment has now come, oh, good God. every one of these institutions would already have been taken over by communists. And let's use this word communist rather more freely than we have in the past, because what it is. After, the McCarthy, after the McCarthy era, it was kind of not fashionable to use the word communist. But now that's the word we have to use. These are Marxists. These are people who wish to control us. And we do not wish to be controlled by them. They, unfortunately, control the overwhelming majority of the news media, which is why your program exists, Alex. There'd be no need for it if the news media were doing their job. So... Because of this extraordinary degree of control that these million agents managed to uh, obtain and which they continued to operate even after the KGB had gone, this was a sort of self-perpetuating organization. Effectively, we on the free market end of things didn't organize. We didn't organize in the same way. Well, it was more elected. disinformation that they completely fell. They did fall because the, the engine failed, but by then they'd already metastasized other cancers into us, they'd and already, now they're manifesting. 
They'd already quietly taken over our major institutions. The BBC is a very and good And they example. are at war with families and wealth, and they admit Cloward and Piven. They want everybody poor so the commissars can sit around at their duchies like kings over us. This is the new royalty. This is the new that, French Revolution. That's it. It's an aristocracy of blackguards. It's exactly what uh, they've been planning all along. And this is a huge attack by the governing class, which is now largely left-wing, on the people. And the people are going to have to get organized in various ways. And Alex, you're going to be a very important part of this because we're literally going to have to establish a resistance movement, just like the French resistance, because that's the kind of regime we're going to end up with You're right. if this carries on. Already they are more and more openly and more and more frequently demanding that the likes of me who dare to do scientific research and publish papers in leading scientific journals raising questions about their yes, new religion of global warming. Be arrested. They're increasingly saying we must be tried, imprisoned, and executed. Well, that's right. They've now changed their tone. The In the last month, there's been five articles I've seen seriously saying, shut me off the air and I'm dangerous. And, and they never used to talk like that. I mean, they're very naked now. And I agree. I believe they're, they're, they're about to make they're their move. They're naked because they think they're very near to power. They think that Paris is going to do it for them. And at the moment, that's right, because we have governments who are intellectually enfeebled. I mean, people like David Cameron, he's a smooth operator, but he doesn't really believe anything or know anything or understand, because he wasn't from that generation that you and I were. We had to fight the communists to eventually prevail over them. He didn't have to do that. So he thinks he can sit back and be part of this world government and somehow it will be a capitalist government on the night. Well, no, it won't. It will be another totalitarian government somewhere sure. between fascism and corporatism and communism. Uh, and if we don't stop it, it will take control sure. over every detail of our lives. Already they're fiddling the data, fiddling the temperature records, fiddling everything so as to try to pretend that what they now perfectly well know isn't happening with the climate is happening because without well, they've already that, done it. They don't call it warming. They call it climate change. Promise us you'll come on from Paris. I'm tempted to go to Paris and Greece next month to cover all this. In fact, I'm looking at it, doing it right now. But thank you so much, Lord Moncton. Give us your website. It's been a pleasure. Go to science and policy, science and public policy dot org. That's the best one to go to. Or what's up with that dot com. W A T T S up with that dot com. Either of those, you'll find plenty of material right. from me on the climate question. So God bless you, Alex, and God bless America. Thank you very much, sir. Well, he's never minced words before, but that was his strongest words. Then that's not rhetoric. Global totalitarianism, it's on. Fascist on top, communist on the bottom, because the globalists are exempt from the communist hell they'll put over the nation states. Diplomatic and political immunity. The new royalty. We are in big trouble. Big trouble. And we're going to have to mobilize. I mean, they want revolution against the police to start a civil war. Communist playbook all the way.